it's my great pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm also quite nervous because this is the first time for me to speak in front of so many mathematicians. So my math is really bad. So please do not criticize me, OK? So I'm talking about microstructure modeling, but uh, using a different technique we're trying to develop in the past 10 years about uh, concurrent or missile continuum model. So many of the results I'm going to share with you are produced by my graduate students. Some of them graduated. Someone is going to graduate. So if you have interest to recruit some students with such background for a postdoc, I'm ha very happy to provide a recommendation letter. Okay? So many of the ideas will not happen without the discussion with many of the colleagues in different universities, national labs, and industry. So I do not want to repeat all of the names here. So it takes 50 minutes, maybe. So I'm going to start the motivation. So the image I want to share with you is quite uh, common. Uh, I believe 100% of people in this room know about what it is. This is polycrystal. So polycrystal, when you deform it, the microstructure evolution could be very complicated. Here I'm showing a microstructure uh, evolution in titanium alloy produced by uh, Professor Biller's group at Michigan State uh, more than 10 years ago. It's uh, quite well known in the community. So if you look at this complicated microstructure, you will see many different reaction mechanisms where event happens. One green boundary, with this kind of things, oops, this, this is a slip. So called slip is dislocation mediated plastic flow, middle with the one green boundary. At some green boundary, you see twinning nucleation and growth. And at some other green boundaries, you see slip come over, slip come over, and slip transmission. So different green boundaries, you have different reaction mechanisms. Even for the same slip induced twinning nucleation and growth, each twin may be involving different twinning variants. You see the colors are the same, but the microstructure could be different. So what is giving this so complicated different reaction mechanism at a different green boundary? So the first reaction might be, might be what is the green boundary structure, right? So green boundary structure definitely play a very different role for different green boundaries. When you have, when you have green boundary one, you see some atomic structure like this. When you see green boundary two, you see a different structure. So when same dislocation come over middle with these different green boundaries, consequence will be different. Another, another factor people didn't pay attention much is uh, so-called internal stress. Recently, many people are studying this kind of effect. So when you have different number of dislocation come over or different type of dislocation come over, even in the same green boundary, but the stress, local stress buildup will be different. So this is a typical experiment measurement from a uh, uh, Wilkinson's group, quite a famous image, more than 10 years, almost 10 years ago. So many people do not believe this magnitude, okay? Uh, local stress cannot be so high, almost one gigapascal. I don't know if it's correct or not, but one thing we can believe is the range. So the range, you can see, does not decay to zero until 12 microns away from the place you measure. So Magnitude, why people do not believe? Because they cannot directly measure the stress. They measure the strain and calculate the stress, right? If you really want to measure stress, you need to measure force per area. But within, with the inside the material, at the sleep, ground boundary intersection, how do you measure the force per area? It's quite a challenge. So they measure the strain and calculate the stress. When you, when you involve calculation, you need to assume what kind of constituent laws are used, right? Elasticity or high order elasticity or high order plasticity. So different constants get into play, they get different magnitude. But one thing you can believe is the range. It has a very long range that not goes to zero at 10 microns away from the green boundary. So, yes? But I'm, I'm assuming the strain they meant is the elastic strain. Yes. So that's Rotation, elastic lattice rotation, yes. Okay. Yes. I, I'm so not, yeah. not, not too much place, room to play with if you measure the elastic strain. But you can, you can involve gradient term, high order terms. If you can involve high order terms, maybe the magnitude will change a little bit. I'm not going to Never mind. Yes. Okay. yes. They measure the 3D strain, because if they just measure the strain in one direction, then it's not really useful, because the other directions matter just as much. 
Yeah. I understand. That's part of the problem. They measure because they can only measure in plane screen, not out of plane. No. Fair enough. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that, I, that, I'm that not really, an expert uh, on but, experiments, yeah. but uh, the, the, the point. Good enough. Want, yes, yes. I want to emphasize is the range. It's quite good. This, if you believe the magnitude is even happier for me. Actually, I want, I want to see high, high stress does exist. But many people do not think so. They think this high stress does not exist within such materials. So we are arguing the local atomic green boundary structure and this long range local internal stress co dictate the subsequent uh, uh, reaction mechanism. You see twinning, you see slip transfer, uh, slip transfer. That is two reasons we want to figure out what is the effect of those two factors. So then we need to use a tool to figure out what, why. So the natural idea, you want to retain the atomistic green boundary structure, you use MD. Right? You use molecular statics or molecular dynamics. But MD, well known, you cannot accommodate many dislocations. The length limit limits you only can accommodate maybe five to eight dislocations using a modest computational cost. And some smart boundary condition maybe can give you uh, this uh, uh, far field dislocation induces the green uh, boundary condition on the simulation box, but it, it's going to evolve. It's going to evolve. That boundary condition is not steady state, especially when reactions happen. So not, so, not so trivial for that kind of boundary condition. So then you want to scale up. I want to evolve tens or even hundreds of dislocations. Then you can do continuum model. Many continuum models exist, right? But continuum model does not provide you with the atomic information on the green boundary. You only can assume this green boundary is a strong barrier, this green boundary is a weak barrier, this boundary is maybe half trans transparent. You have to tell the solver how the reaction will happen. Otherwise, the, the solver will, know, will not know how to proceed. Right? So that is, I call, it, I call it as a limited resolution because you do not have enough resolution on the green boundary. So that is what we are attempting. So we are trying to develop a tool that can accommodate many dislocations away from the green boundary, but also the atomic structure on the green boundary. And then when that is accommodated, if complicated reaction happens, you have 20, you have phase nucleation, you should be able to accommodate it also. Otherwise, your reaction mechanism is also not be predictive. So then, this is a sketch we draw many, many years ago. But not until today, we achieved something, but not fully achieved yet. So in the far away regime, we want to use a coarse green model or continuum model to describe these locations. But on the green boundary or near the green boundary, we want to add a mystical resolution. So we set up some standards for this rule. Right? You cannot duplicate all of the existing tools. You cannot duplicate MD. So we want to be faster than MD, right? And we want to use the potential as the only constituent relation. We do not want to use interaction rules. Tell the solver how this is going to interact. We do not want to involve that. So we want to retain the atomistic core structure because you have edge type mix, especially for PCC or high entropy alloy. The line structure is very rough. You want to retain those kind of fine structure in the far field. Otherwise. When it comes over, the reaction cannot be so true. And then we want to abandon those dislocation, dislocation induction rules in the far field. When the reaction happens, the dislocation configuration could change. So what is the reaction, what is the reaction should be, if it got too close, what's going to happen in between? We do not want to assume something. Okay? And then we want to pass dislocation from far region to the atomic region and go, go away from the atomic region. So, of course, the last one is retain the atomistic green boundary structure evolution because most of the green boundary structure are not equilibrium. So we cannot assume sigma 3 stays as a sigma 3. Right? So during the reactions, the state of the green boundary keep on evolving. You have to retain a high resolution there. So this necessitates a novel coarse grained description of dislocations in the far field or at a meso scale. Many people saw this uh, slide uh, uh, before, and uh, I want to spend one page talking about this uh, so-called uh, the theoretical foundation of this uh, uh, tool. And it's built upon a uh, so-called uh, atomistic field formulation. The idea, we need a continuum model for dislocations. Right? 
So what do you need for describe dislocation continuum? We need slip plane, we need box vector, and if you can give me core structure, that would be fantastic, right? So then we consider a materials as a continuous body. It's a collection of x. x continuously occupy the whole space without hole, right? That is continuum mechanics. But within x, you can group atoms. You can embed a group of atoms. So those things are so-called unicell. So there's a key assumption here. We assume the solid materials is continuous at a unicell level. You point, the, you point, you point any point in the materials, I tell you there's a unicell there, there, okay? But within the unicell, it's discrete. So you point a unicell, but you cannot tell me which atom you're pointing. So that is so-called a two-length scale description. One is at a unicell level, deformable, okay, from x to x prime. Class of continuum only have x, y, z, three translation degree freedom. Each x is not deformable. So when x is deformable, you have many different treatments. You have macropolar, you have macromorphic theory. People are different, different group use different assumptions to assume how x will deform within uh, sub-length scale. We are dealing with, okay, we do not use those continuous definition, uh, definition anymore. Within each x, we have a group of atoms. They can move with respect to each other. It's totally discrete. So you have two length scales. One is continuous at x level. The other one is within the x. Then trouble will come, right? One is discrete. One is continuous. How are you going to merge them in one model? How are you going to, how are you going to make them consistent? So we need it. Continuous, discrete, usually the idea is to link through statistical mechanics. So when you have atoms moving with space to each other, with the time going down, with the space average, with time average, you can extract continuous quantities. Mass, energy flux, stress, those quantities can all be extracted from MD simulation because you have some formulation. You have statistics, statistical mechanics. So the idea is here I'm showing you one quantity is uh, stress. This is a 1D chain, okay? You have many atoms. Surrounding each atom, you can define a volume element, and you have many interactions. It's not near its neighbor, it's not local interaction. This atom will interact with all of the neighbors in the system. And the force will go through the surfaces you define. Around each atom, you define a volume, right? Each volume carries six surfaces. So those forces, we are going through those surfaces. Force per area can come into play. So you see the definition, this is from interatomic potential. This is a stress at a continuum level. This is totally discrete. No matter how many neighbors you have, just count. Each pair will have a force. This is a force per area unit. Delta function is the key mathematical rule. If you talk about it, there's a math, this is the only math I have here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> if this is wrong, then I can walk out of the room and go back to North Carolina. <laughs> So this delta is a key tool we use because delta is, a con is con considering a contribution which pair is contributing to the stress at this point. This is a sigma at this point. Many forces are going through this area. But different neighbors will contribute differently. Nearby, nearest neighbor contributed the most. Away from the point I'm considering is contributing less. So that is why you can define this delta function. You can use the delta function to connect the discrete interatomic induction with the continuous stress. Stress is also called a moment flux. You can follow the same idea to define all of the other things. Heat flux, mass density, all of the quantities you need in the continuum mechanics can be defined this way. Then when you have physical quantity, you can derive balance equations because you have mass density, you have stress, you can, you can do the moment, momentum equilibrium, energy equilibrium, conservation, those things, right? So I'm showing you an uh, equation of motion or moment balance. So you see this form is quite familiar. It's the same as continuum mechanics. But I put one thing here is potential because I only consider the interaction between the atoms. I didn't consider the fluctuation of the atoms yet. I'm going to show you a different equation in a later page. So this one is defined this way, and rho also is mass density. It's also defined through the delta function. F external is the external force field. So when you have sigma defined this way, you can take a divergence of stress. You do not need the so-called Hooke's law or any other constitutive law in continuum mechanics 
to do sigma and do the divergence. So then you can get rid of those classical constitutive laws you need for the continuum model. You do the waveform, multiply this equation on both sides with the shear function. Yesterday, one speaker mentioned this. Uh, mathematician always have a PDE, then multiply a weighting function and do the integration over the whole domain. So this is the same what we did. This is the shear function and multiply it, and then you can discretize it to get a matrix form. So the difference between this and the classical FE is in classical FE, you have the same, but this sigma is not defined through atomic level. It's defined from Hooke's law, usually, and then you can formulate a K matrix, and you can solve this dynamic matrix uh, equation. Here is through interatomic potential, okay? So this is a key idea. Of course, the real, the, 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 the detailed mathematical duration is very tedious. So it's, it's in many of these three papers in general for chemical physics. So it's, it's quite tedious. And uh, here I'm just trying to make my life easier to understand how this uh, theory works. And then we have result one issue. We do not need constitutive laws. We have interatomic potential governing everything, okay? Then the second benefit when you involve the atoms within each X is you can involve the sleep system within each X. So this is the example, single crystal, FCC copper. You discretize it into many elements, and each element, because each element is a collection of many atoms, you can configure those elements according to the system you want to study, right? You want to study FCC, you know what is the sleep system. You know where sleep is going to be preferred. So you design your element according to the sleep system you want. So this is a second idea. We uh, implement it, design the element according to the crystalline system you want to design, uh, model. So this is one typical benchmark example we did. Typical benchmark example people will ask you for dislocation is Frank rich source multiplication, right? So this is a uh, two void obstacle. Nearby the obstacle, you can use very fine resolution, admissible resolution, far away, use this cross grain model. Then you introduce the initial dislocation, then you share it to see, can you get this, there's a movie here. So, Ta-da. Yeah, it's, it's playing, but uh, initially it's very slow because it's a strong barrier when you have very small spacing between two obstacles, that tau C could be huge. So not so easy to pull it. But uh, you see something is moving, you can click this one also. So this one is directly from our so-called CAC simulation. And you see blow out and the multiplication, the full loop formed. And this one is mapped from this result. It's not solved, okay? You run MD, you can get the same results. But we are not solving for the equation motion for each atom. Because we have atomic information within each element, when we finish a solution, we have the mesh configuration, we just map out how the atoms in that model config, and then we get this result. This is from Oveto, okay? I should have put a reference here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this, is the, this is the results. The good thing about this model, if you do MD, L, is limited, right? You can do tens of nanometer. You cannot do 200 nanometer. So you need to fit what is the critical stress to bow this dislocation. And if you do MD, maybe you have the data, you can believe these results. Oh, you can, you can do a very large one here, and you, you fit. Maybe you get wrong parameter. So this is the thing that we are trying to be supplemented with a nanoscale MD simulation. Thank you. High five. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so the second one is a BCC crystal. FCC is easy. Right? FCC, the core structure is planar. It's just glide. So BCC crystal give you more challenge because the core structure is not planar. It's 3D, uh, long planar structure. So you have to redesign your element, of course, because BCC have different preferred sleep plane. And then we reproduce core structure first. So building a dislocation to see can we get the lump plan and the core structure at the element boundary? This is a coarse element. Each element contains 512 atoms. And this uh, purple line shows the boundary of the elements. And at the corner of these elements, you see this is a core structure. So this is from the mapping of the mesh configuration. It's not soft. Those small arrows are so-called a displacement differential map. It's a post-process technique. 
to show the 3D fold structure of a core of BCC dislocation. And we compare it with fully atomistic molecular statics, right? You can get uh, almost the same core structure. That is not the end of the story for BCC because BCC has another challenge. When you have a long planar core structure, the barrier to move it is very high. You have to apply a huge stress to trigger the motion of them, different from planet. So usually, people use thermal uh, activation to help the dislocation motion, not people, uh, nature. Right? Because you see BCC ion, how they form, how, how they plastically deform, because if you deform that at zero temperature, you need a very high stress to deform it. But at a room temperature, you may not need that high stress because thermal activation kink will help. So we need to introduce the temperature into the equation. Previously, you only see this term, this term. Now we need another temperature effect come into play. What is the temperature effect in MD? Temperature will give you fluctuation of the atoms. So fluctuation will give you the kinetic stress. Instantaneous fluctuation give you the kinetic stress, fluctuation about, uh, around the potential stress. So we define a kinetic stress come into play to help. This one is, should be also non-local, non-linear, right? Because your sigma po potential is from interatomic force field, it's non-local. How many neighbors you have, you, you calculate it. So sigma k should be also non-local, should be consistent. So how to maintain that non-locality? We, we suffered this for 80 years. I got my tenure at Iowa State in, eight, uh, in six years working on this project how to introduce temperature into the model. We tried many different strategies, didn't work out well. This one seems to be the best so far. Okay, if you have a better idea, we'd be happy to talk. So the kinetic stress, we associate with the fluctuation of the atom, then fluctuation atoms, if we do Fourier transform, is the phonon, it's a phonon vibration. So this is the phonon density of states, frequency, normal mode, phonon density of states, you see many peaks, so BCC has three peaks, one longitudinal, two transverse peaks. So then you have different frequency, right? So then you introduce that vibration through the frequency that material should have into the kinetic stress. And then that is where start to vibrate. And then the dislocation migration will not be straight. It's not gonna, it's gonna be rough. So this is a testing case we run three micrometer core screen model, introduce the initial dislocation into BCC, and then start apply a shear stress. If you do not introduce temperature, it will be very persistent, very stubborn, and not move. If you introduce the temperature, you have a fluctuation, then you can move. But when it moves, it's gonna be very rough. How, how much time I have? Maybe 10 minutes, right? Oh, 20 minutes, okay, good. So, one quarter. So then you have, you, you map this dislocation configuration to the atomic arrangements. Again, you get this rough dislocation line and actually even debris, uh, debris formation after it has swept through. And still people need to, to justify, why do I believe you? This is correct. So we need to do many quantitative study. So the first quantitative study we, do, we did is how about the kink separation distribution analysis. We tried different lengths, right? 60 nanometer, 150, 1,000, and one, almost one micron. You see many rough things on that dislocation line. That is called kink. It's not a street anymore. So the separation between the kinks is the distance, nearest neighbor distance. They follow a distribution. We have shorter, medium length, and very long. You see they, when you have longer and longer dislocation, the separation or nearest neighbor distance between them is got Larger and larger. Still not convincing. So how about comparing with experiment data? 60, 150, 100 micron, this is the experiment data. So flow stress versus temperature. You introduce different fluctuations through that data uh, sigma came, and you, you will have temperature effect. So we see the flow stress will decrease when you increase the temperature. When you have very short dislocation line, 60 nanometer, you, you, you're far away from experiment data. When you increase the discipline line lengths, you're approaching experiment data, but still far away. Because at least at one aspect, you're approaching experiment data. Experimentally, the distribution line, average length is one micrometer or even above. You cannot rely on MD to 
predict this, except you introduce some correction. Okay? So, but still, you said, oh, I need one micron, but why still I'm far away from experiments? I have many other issues. In experiments, they're not talking about one single distribution line, many distribution lines. And the second thing is, in experiments, they have many defects. It's not just perfect single crystal. You have many vacancy or voids that will, some people argue there's uh, so-called stress. Uh, uh, dislocation pipe induced the internal stress actually help dislocation motion in BCC and introduce a reduction of the flow stress in experiments. But it's complicated. In this paper, we spend one page talking about this gap. Hopefully, the review will, will buy it. So the second thing we, the second privilege we can have is when we have temperature effect introduced, we can do temperature jump test. Temperature jump test means the same stress, run simulation at a different temperature. So another jump test that we can do is so-called strain rate jump test. Same temperature, but different strain rate deform the materials. These two kinds of tests are commonly used in experiments to measure the activation volume and activation enthalpy for kink. And of course, in experiments, people also use a so-called stress relaxation technique to measure the activation enthalpy. But jump test is one, one technique people can do. So we, we run jump test. Jump test means I run different strain rates, the same simulation I showed you before. And you will get the critical stress you need to move that dislocation will change when you change the strain rate, right? This is the change of the critical stress. This is the strain rate you run. And then you can calculate what is delta V, activation volume. When you have activation volume ready, you can run another serial test, so-called a temperature jump test, maintain the same strain rate. Keep changing the temperature. When you increase the temperature, sigma C will decrease. So you can calculate delta H. And then this is the delta H, this is the temperature. Experimentally, calculate this, you get a very nice linear fitting between the temperature and activation enthalpy. C coefficient is usually 25 in experiments, 20 to 25. We are far away from there. We have maybe, but a, a good sign is when you increase the discipline line, it's getting closer, but still far away from there. So one, one technique, one, one, one equation I finally found from the literature is people simply correct it, do not run any simulations. So how does, how, why, why, do, why do we need to correct it? Because all of the string rate jump tests I run is very fast. I, I scale up in length, but I didn't scale up in time yet. My string rate is still very high. In experiments, the strain rate is 10 to minus 4, 10 to minus 2, something. So people need to correct it. You see how smart this equation is? This is from a physical review letter from a Dr. Monat group from France. So he ca calculates a lot of data and found if you use the strain rate ratio simulation experiments, correct it. You can follow a reasonably comparison between your simulation and uh, experiment data. We use this equation and found it, it is it is working very well. But this is not a final solution. Final solution, you still need to reduce your strain rate in this no matter multi-scale or MD simulation. This gap needs to be rigorously filled. But we do not have a good idea yet. Uh, hopefully, Amit will uh, talk tomorrow about time scale issues. I'm looking forward to it. Strain rate effect. Okay, that's not the the next challenge we are facing is passing dislocation from far region to the green boundary and migrate for away from the green boundary. So this one is far away. This is the green boundary. When it transmit, it wants to go away. You cannot let him stop there. Otherwise, the prediction of local stress will be in trouble. So this is what we recently figured out. We can use uh, the, we have a dislocation in that uh, atomic region. You know the position of the atoms. Each atom invo uh, get involved in the dislocation. You know the position of them. So x, y, z is the position of them. You can formulate a matrix of them, calculate the eigenvalue and the eigenvector of this matrix. The eigenvector of that matrix is the slip plane. So you can define the slip plane and split your mesh along that plane. So this is what we did. And we tried a bicrystal in kernel 87. So on the green boundary, you have very complicated chemistry, but far away, you have dislocation coming over. So this is a pie up. This is the transmission detection transmitted. You do not refine all of the elements into the fully atomistic region. 
you just simply split the elements, let the green boundary accommodate the slip transmission. So I'm going to show you something of this uh, re uh, uh, results from this model and its comparison with experiments. So the first, well, the first example I want to show you is uh, how about the local stress. So local stress in titanium, as I said, as I showed in the very beginning of this presentation, spans tens of microns, does not decay to zero. So you, if you want to get that long range stress, you have to pile up many dislocations on the green boundary. So we exactly build a bicrystal, the same as uh, orientation as uh, what they have in the experiments. It will involve one billion atoms if you do pure MD or MS. So we get this stress profile ahead of the pipe tip. You increase the number of the dislocation in the pipe, you're getting closer to them, but still there's a gap there. As I said, because stress measurements in experiments could be different from what we are doing here. We have two strategies in, in simulation. We can do very real stress calculation. We can define a volume associated with each item, do the force per area. So we try both. So force per, this is uh, energy per volume, is a very real formulation. This is, uh, you define a finite volume associated with each atom, calculate the force, and force by area, calculate the Cauchy stress. So this is what happened. If you use a real stress formulation, you can, you can get closer to closer to experiment data, but still there's a gap there. And another thing you, pay, you notice that is in the real stress formulation, even in the formula, you can see that is the shear stress is always symmetry, right? So you can interchange K and L does not change the sign, does not change the difference between them. There's no difference between sigma X, Y and sigma YX. But if you follow the force per area, a strange thing happens. So we calculate the interatomic force per area and we have the area defined. Force per area, we calculate uh, different stress com shear stress components. We found the stress profile is different. It's, sim it's asymmetry. It's asymmetry, and we tried a different one. Again, it's asymmetry. We pair up more dislocation, and this asymmetry breaking point is moving away from the green boundary. So I talked to this to Jason Meyer and said, do you think this is true or not? I talked to him on purpose because I know he will say this is true. <laughs> so he is working on micropolar crystal plasticity. Micropolar plasticity has uh, additional degree freedom, couple of stress, or micro rotation. In classical plasticity or continuum mechanics, shear stress is symmetry. There's no couple stress. But when you have micropolar crystal plasticity, you will have asymmetry shear stress, you have permuter tensor, you will have non-zero M. If sigma JK equals sigma KJ, this permuter tensor, this one will be zero. But in micropolar, this one is asymmetry, you will get non-zero. We have non-zero, you have additional constitutive relations, you have constitutive material constants getting involved. So this is what he formulated. So he formulates uh, a set of equation and about this is a curvature of a macro rotation. This is a strain, micropolar strain. This is the elastic constant. This is the relation between so-called couple stress and the curvature, D. And this is a, this is a uh, rotation, gradient of rotation gives you the curvature. So this is the whole idea about that micropolar plasticity. He has published uh, a, a serious paper on that. I, uh, if you have interest, you can take a look at his uh, paper and uh, more details. So what I can do is currently I'm working together with him. I can measure this curvature. I can measure this couple stress because I have asymmetry shear stress. I can calculate those things and uh, fit or calculate this coefficient he need. And he then use this model, use this coefficient in his model to predict uh, the microstructure evolution at a continuum level. And yesterday he told me that this D is not a constant. If you send a different distribution over, this D will change. M and chi will follow a nonlinear relation. He suggests me to machine learning. I said, I'm, I don't know machine learning, but I will try. So we are stopping at here at this stage. How many time do I have? Question? OK. So, so just so I understand, yes. uh, you, you get these. Uh, Non symmetric stress. Yes. M. Okay. yes. But what equation did you solve? Did you solve your linear momentum? Yes, equation? I solved my linear momentum. Then you took about the balance. You didn't solve the equation. You're, you're talking about the balance, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Balance but I know the balance is destroyed. Exactly. Yeah. We're checking on that. What is, what is the reason for that moment balance 
you get you, you only solve linear momentum, but you get a balance of uh, angular momentum. Yeah, that's yes. not all. That's yes, all. yes, yes. That's a good question. Actually, Lauren, Dr. Lauren Kaplan also raised the same issue to me. He, we are doubting that that F internal by using the constitutive relation contain that micro rotation already. So that F that, that sigma potential, that term contains some rotation and couple stress already. We will double check. I, I, I'm sorry, I do not have the answer. Okay. Yeah, but actually, this is a very good question, and Laurent also raised the same question to me. Yeah. So the second one is uh, how about maybe the last example I'm going to show you this one because this paper just got accepted yesterday. So the comparison, the stress with the experiment measurement. So we are lucky to find an experiment collaborator in Georgia Tech, a Jewish Cassius group. He recently measured how the local stress will evolve when the sleep green boundary reaction happens. So this is a sleep, this is a green boundary, and when they increase the plastic strain, they use EBSD to measure local stress evolution. So when you see a red regime, means local stress is going up. When you see a blue regime, local stress is going down. So they plot the stress profile during the transmission. So they check many different green boundaries. And the so same thing happens. But uh, different green boundaries, the pattern seems to be a little bit different. They want to correlate the green boundary mismatch with the local stress evolution. When they define a green boundary mismatch, they need a parameter. Geometric mismatch between two greens. Usually, people use this last Morris parameter, the most straightforward one, because you have mismatch, you have misorientation, you can define those angles, you can calculate what is M. So really, the larger M, the more compatible between those two grains. You can imagine if this one's zero, this one's zero, M is one, right? So M is one, there's no mismatch. Direct transmission, M, larger M, the more geometric transferable, and there's no stress concentration, because it's totally no misorientation. So they use this rule to check. How about I check different M, different stress concentration. This is the experiment data. Increase the M, increase the M, more geometrically compatible. Direct transmission is coming, so the local stress or maximum stress is going down. So random ground boundary, okay? Larger M, lower stress concentration. But they do, fi do find some strange things. When they, when they check coherent twin boundary and the incoherent twin boundary, the trend reversed. So this M is huge, it's one. You should expect a direct transmission, but the stress concentration is very high, triple of this this one. So they said, can you provide some mechanism for us and the rest of some simulation like this? Uh, I said, why you are not working with MD people? You have so many MD people in Georgia Tech, said, I have so many dislocation come over and those configuration of dislocation will change during a reaction. So I need your uh, simulation tool to check. So this is the model we built upon him. They said, we need many dislocation because he want to check the history of the dislocation evolution. So it goes to 1.5 micron. And then we send the dislocation over, and this is the trend we found. So the same trend, the same trend, same trend, this is from simulation, this is experiments, increase M, you decrease uh, uh, stress concentration. Same thing, re reverse trend is also retained. You get one, but a very high stress concentration. So you may immediately notice, oh, why you have a such high stress? They have only this maybe one gigapascal, you have eight gigapascal. So two reasons, maybe three reasons. One is you need a window to measure stress, right? Stress is force per area. You can define force per micrometer area or per nanometer area. So you, this L is a window size. Our window size is five angstrom. It's tiny. So, or at most, we, we check one series L. When you increase L, this can decrease. This magnitude can decrease. The other thing, this is a maximum stress. Ahead of the PAP tip, which location you think you have maximum stress is, is a questionable, right? So we define, okay, 0.5 nanometer. This is the first point I want to measure. But experimentally, definitely you do not have such high resolution. So two reasons. We, we want to compare qualitatively only. So we showed him this mechanism. We have large M. We have large M equal to one. It's low angle green boundary. Dislocation come over, very easy to transmit. Dislocation, the repulsive force between dislocation just simply push this dislocation out. 
low angled green boundary can be considered as a collection of many dislocations. The repulsive forces simply push it out. So transmission happens, no stress concentration. So high angle, very high angle, very difficult to transmit, get a pile up. And transmission eventually happens due to the loop, nucleation, and growth. And intermediate, you have twinning, nucleation, and uh, growth. So I maybe escape this two movie. Don't bother you. It's uh, escape two movie issues: ITV and uh, CTV. Choose that trend. It's uh, just it, it's, it's playing. I'm lucky. So you see, this is M. This one supposed to have uh, M is lower than this one. This one should be direct transmission. This one should be pi up. This is what we expect because smaller M, more uh, geometry mismatch. But actually. When you have a mystical resolution on the green boundary, they migrate away from the ground, green boundary. Stress got released. This is a stress profile. Okay? So this wind come over, migrate away. For this one, it's not playing. It will have a pie up. It will have a pie up. I can show you after the sign now. Okay? It's, yeah. So it get pie up. Seems to be a straight transmission, but get pie up and then transmission. Get a, a little bit accumulation at here. So that is why we want to emphasize uh, we want to emphasize the atomic structure resolution on the green boundary. That is very important. And do I have time? Yeah. Six more minutes. Maybe I go through this. This is uh, last example. So when you have stress, local stress there, what is the role for the of them in the subsequent structure change? You not only have transmission in reality, you have 20. Right? You have 20 and phase transition, you have many other things. So then if you want to introduce uh, activated twinning or phase transition, shear may not be enough. So we need to apply more mechanical loading on that to trigger it. So this is the one sample test we did. It's not real material. So, oops. So hexagonal square is a phase boundary right now because we want to study phase transition. We did two phases on purpose. And then pile up dislocation on the left. And then we shear it to pile up the dislocation. Of course, this is the same stress concentration. And one thing, one interesting thing we found is we have our missile resolution on the phase boundary. So we feed this stress profile to a different model because this kind of model exists, widely exists in uh, literature, pile up induced stress. People usually use HP model or super dislocation model. Our data shows none of them will work very well. The reason is HP model is assuming interface is a rigid wall. This screen come over, pie up simply. No deformation on the interface. This is what HP model says. Super dislocation model says when dislocation come over, form one box vector step, second one come over, second box vector. So then the stress decay like this way. HP model decay like this way, like a crack tip, right? Crack tip, super dislocation. But when you have reality, those two should happen simultaneously. You have step formation, but also the green boundary structure will be a barrier to the dislocation. You have pile up, you have step formation. So this is our major argument in that paper. We want to test it in real materials. Currently, we're still working on the real materials because uh, the review of the second paper asking, you already published one paper about the fake materials. I want to see that in real materials. No real materials, no publication. So this is what we are doing right now. So, and then I skip this one. So what is the role of this local stress on the phase transition, as I said? When you pile up a dislocation, you compress it to see the pile up will help the dislocation or not. So this, this orange one is the original phase, square. Blue one is hexagonal new phase. When you pile up dislocation from the left, you start to compress it. So compressive strain along this y direction. So you monitor the stress, what's the strain? And this plateau means free transition will happen. So when you increase the shear stress, this is the shear stress, you are injecting more and more dislocation on the pile up tip. One, six, seven, eight. This plateau goes down. So this plateau means stress, uh, free transition happen. So it means you have more dislocation pile up, your stress, the stress required for the free transition decrease. So we plot this curve and choose the critical stress versus the number of dislocation you have. So actually, uh, not only that, because you have a mystical resolution on the green boundary, the phase transition will not worry growth. 
When you have an internal stress buildup, it will, will always try to find a way to relax. This, this material is always very smart. You build a stress to me, I want to relax. So how to relax it? So relax it in this one, you relax it by reverse phase transition. I cannot grow further. I need to relax my stress. So this blue region come back to red. This red comparing with respect to the original red form a twinning. So it's called a reverse phase transition and then twinning. And I want to emphasize why do we need such a model? You do not, if you do not have atomistic resolution nearby this tip, you cannot get this. You cannot get this, except you tell the solver this will happen, right? So this is the natural consequence of the simulation. And that's the example, this one, just one movie. This one movie has to play. Yeah, so this is the last movie I want to show because we have coarse screen model. We can do green size, green size distribution, green size distribution analysis, right? People, this so-called gradient structure is very, nowadays very popular. People want to design the gradient to get a super high strength and super ductility and even chemical uh, composition gradient. We just try uh, structure gradient. Because you have larger space, because you have coarse graining, you can do from several nanometer to maybe one micrometer. You have a huge uh, design space to do that. Otherwise, if you do MD, you can do five nanometer to 20 nanometer at the most. That is called a gradient in MD model, right? So you cannot explore a full spectrum of the design space. And we have dislocation come over and the intact. This is a map, again, this is the map from this simulation. Okay, I'm done. So just go to the summary. Do I need to repeat my summary? I'll, I'll, sk I'll skip there, you yeah. can go ahead. So I can verbally summarize uh, what we did. We developed a uh, tool, and that tool, the major feature is uh, coarse grain description of distributing far away from the ground boundary. And that tool can be used to calibrate the large range stress induced by the pop. Okay, but, um, but uh, it's, it's not a final solution. I, I have, we are suffering from many issues. Here I just raised two of them. The first one is uh, real events. Because you are not only dealing with plasticity, you are dealing with many other structure changes in the microstructure structure evolution. You have diffusion, you have uh, phase transition nucleation, you have kink, those dislocation line is not, rough, is not straight, it's rough. So those things are real events and takes a long time. You see many things I produced already, I cheated because I use high, high stress to overdrive the system. This actually happens in many MD community. Use high stress to drive the things I want that happen, right? But in experiments, the dislocation move at a 20 megapascal. If you do 20 megapascal simulation MD, it takes you forever to get the results. So that is why real events is also a quite challenge for us. And Amir is going to talk about some time scale issue on Friday, I believe. So I hope I can learn something from you. Yeah. The second one is uh, we have you combine a mixed domain and a coarse grain domain, you have different resolutions for dynamics. Immediately you run into an issue, wave. Right? You have wave reflection on the green bound, on the boundary, even uniform single crystal. You have high resolution here, coarse resolution here. Short wave lengths come over, cannot go to the coarse region because coarse region does not accommodate the short wave lengths. So we tried something. So we tried something like this. So we enrich the shape function in the position in the coarse grain domain to accommodate the short wavelength propagation in the continuum domain. But it only works for one dimensional. We're trying to two dimensional and three dimensional. So that, that's, that's a challenge we are facing. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you.